Hey everybody, I'm Rick Beato. Today on Everything Music, my guest is guitarist Tosin Abasi, creator of Soundscapes and the composer and founder of Animals as Leaders. Tosin's the head of a new guitar movement in which he seamlessly blends sonic walls of distortion, odd meters, and technical virtuosity into a unique blend of metal, jazz, and I would say modern classical music. Here's my interview with Tosin. What's up, Tosin? What's up, Rick? Nice to see you. <laughs> nice to see you too. You got your wall of amps behind you. Yeah, on top here is a. It's the twin sister, which is basically a Friedman um, Dirty Shirley, but it's the two channel version. This one's a prototype. Uh, so nice. I think most of them are single channel. It's really cool. I, I really, I really dig the voicing of the amp. I've got my Morgan. This is what I've been touring with. It's a single channel point to point hand wired head. Um, that I use as a pedal platform. And then I've got uh, the Jakey e. Lee. Uh, yeah. This is the signature Friedman head. It's really cool. It almost has that that sort of like 1959 Super Lead uh, Marshall where you got a, you dine it and you get this type of aggressive transient attack with all that transformer grind on each transient. It's kind of like this, it's very Yngwie, but I'm sure, you know, <laughs> that, that, that's my point of reference for that sound. But I think it's also... The brown sound kind of comes from that as well. So it's a really cool head. Um, and then this is the BE100 uh, Deluxe. And then uh, this one here is the Bill Kelleher uh, signature head. So it's kind of like all the flavors of Friedman um, that I'm fortunate enough to have here to mess around and, and just see what I like, you know? Is that a Morgan cabinet you're playing through? This is a Morgan 412. Okay. And then I have a Morgan open back 212. Uh, I think there's G, um, G4Hs in it, or I forget. I kind of like I go off my ear, and then it's like literally the cab I use, so I'm not really like sourcing other cabs, but yeah. Okay, so what have you been working on during this lockdown period? I've been like diving into Logic Pro, <laughs> like trying to get better at production. There you the thing go. That you excel at. I've been watching your videos. <laughs> I'm like, oh, optical compressor versus the. <laughs> <laughs> Just so I can make demos and stuff like that, I think the modern musician basically has to be part producer now. I think a new reality for some musicians, and it's something for younger guys that's just, it's always been, you had a laptop or a home recording set up and you could, you could make full blown demos. So I'm, I'm a little bit behind the curve with how good I am at that. So I've been using this downtime to just literally crank out demos and just have this iterative process, get faster at recording, better at mixing, better at programming drums and stuff like that. And then on the guitar, and I've been working on just like um, instructional stuff I'm finding online, surprise, uh, surprisingly enough. There's a lot of major scale stuff I'm working on, just like contrary motion of like the major scale in all these positions. Just so like, I'm a fan of counterpoint, so like I'm trying to get a little bit more fluent with that. And then there's some technique stuff I've been working on, selective picking. That one in particular is really interesting. of notes but I'm dividing my left and right hand so the simplest explanation is like if I was to do like octaves um, and I wanted to do three notes per per octave right. I would hammer on the first note and then and then I would pick the other two so you have one two three one two three Tosin I was trying to do this when you were when you told me about this a couple weeks ago and I and I was tr I was thinking, wait a minute, how does he do this again? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's, it's actually like for anyone who's learned alternate picking, this is literally like unlearning something that you've tried to ingrain. Yeah, synchronizing the left and right hand. So it's counterintuitive, but I found that for string skipping and large interval leaps and just creating phrases that um, aren't encouraged when you're alternate picking everything. Um, 
it really allows for these new sort of lines and sort of patterns to come out. So like, if I took like a D major chord, um, there's all these rhythmic patterns like, That's so cool. Yeah. Yeah, I dig it. It's kind of got like a timbre that it's part banjo, part thumb piano, part kalimba, <laughs> part, <laughs> you know. Um, so I've been doing that a lot. Um, I've also been doing this thing that's similar, uh, but it involves muting with the right hand. So like, um, hmm. So you can get like... You know, wow. but the cool thing is like the speed you can get with it. Like for arpeggios as well, like it's Tosin, why did it take so long to come up with these things? I, I, why, why didn't people do this when I was learning the guitar 40 years ago? Man, I think... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's a good question. I think there's, look, a lot of people are inspired to play based off of music they've heard before, mm -hmm. and then so there's, there's emulation involved, and you want to recreate the sounds of your heroes or your favorite music, and so you, you do what they did, which is the most reasonable thing to do, um, every once in a while, someone will come up with something like two-handed tapping, and you're like, whoa, why didn't anyone think of that, right? But then it becomes just something that exists in the communal consciousness of guitar players, and it's no longer really seen as like a new idea. And it gets increasingly harder to find these things that haven't been done before. Um, and not everyone is necessarily that motivated to produce those sounds. I mean, it's like, some people just want to sound like John Mayer or Stevie Ray Vaughan or, you know, whatever the case is which is totally fine. Um, I want to do that, but I also want to create new sounds on the guitar just because I listen to a lot of non-guitar music. I don't know. Like, uh, so yeah, I think that's, that's part of it. And then also it's like, it, some of it's counterintuitive and there's always a learning curve. Like if you already know how to play, um, there's a whole lifelong journey of like getting better at playing in a traditional way. You don't always want to be like, oh, well, let me start, you know, learning how to use a pick and all these three fingers at the same time because it feels like going back in time to being a beginner yeah and it's frustrating you know so you use the you have thumping you have hybrid picking swibrid picking right you have uh you have selective <laughs> oh. picking all these different techniques with the right hand and then you you have all these different techniques with the left hand as well hammer ons from nowhere yeah yeah um it sounds like so many techniques, but it's it's all. They're kind of you know, variations producing. on other, on, on, you know, some are just variations on other ones. But the coordination between the two hands, especially when you, if you're having hybrid picking and then you're ta ha doing hammer ons from nowhere on this hand and just putting all those things together is very challenging. Yeah, but it's 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 cool because I think um, not many people are doing it, so I get to like define a voice for myself and then. As like someone who I mean, I like progressive music, I I'm always trying to progress, and um, that means that I have to conceive of new ways of producing harmony and rhythm on the guitar. Um, and then the third part is like you know there are musicians who don't play guitar who are inspiring me, like Vic Victor Wooten and Hadrian Farad and you know Evan Marion, who guys who are playing all, on bass at a virtuosic level. Yeah. Yes. So like. Um, So the thumping stuff, <laughs> as a metalhead, it uh, I heard it. In, I heard Victor Wooten doing this stuff, and I was just like enamored with the aggression of the sound. But he's usually doing it in like a funk context, and I was like, dude, I bet if you plug that into some metal, it would, <laughs> it would sound crazy. <laughs> so I labored over learning how to do it, and the mechanics of thumping translated into selective picking. Um, so it kind of is like a evolutionary branch off of you know some core. 
concepts. You know, when I watch Victor play, I've I've uh, I've done a couple of Victor's uh, theory camps. Victor is so fluid with that, and he's you know he's been doing these things for so long, and it's really fascinating to watch that th- this is just so part of his of his playing. When I went last year, I think it was last year or two years ago, Stanley Jordan came and played on the same day that I was there, and to see Stanley. Wow. Who I hadn't seen play since the 80s, he had created that whole voice for himself, like you're talking about, like you're doing for the guitar. Yeah, it, it is incredible. You named two dudes who I think really reconceived how to play the guitar, whether it's bass or... Here's here's the thing with Vic. I, I, I saw him playing, and, and it's like, this guy's playing a stringed instrument. Like, he can do the bass stuff. But then he, he goes beyond bass to it's just now he's just manipulating a stringed instrument. Right. And how many ways can you produce sound on a stringed instrument? That's kind of, it just like did something in my brain to where, you know, that's why I got all these strings on my guitar <laughs> and I try to think of all these ways of producing, you know, um, different sounds. So yeah, I really love uh, really visionary forward thinking players, you know. We chatted about Holdsworth and guys like Steve Vai and anyone who's like taken guitar and just did this quantum leap thing with their musical ideas, you know? So I, I've always wanted to be one of those one of those dudes. Do you think, Tosin, that beyond, you know, you're talking about being good at production, things like that, not only playing the guitar, but then the guitar design, for example. That's another thing about you that people that are watching this that don't know you, you have your own guitar company, that's your guitar there and you're really involved in guitar design. Can you talk about that for a minute? So playing extended range guitar meant that you had limited options from like major manufacturers. Things have changed now, but like, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago, a seven string guitar was like, whoa, what's that? (laughs) And then, you know, a fan fret guitar is like, what's that? So I used to have to kind of commission custom guitars. It was always this thing that I would dream of like, man, what if Ivan has made something like this? Or what if, you know, and eventually that did happen. But my experience of specking my own custom builds kind of gave me um, a lot of experience in just knowing what I wanted in an extended range guitar. I think there's amazing design in the six string category guitar. It's very, I mean, Leo Fender kind of got a lot of things right, you know. (laughs) But what happens when the guitar needs to go down a full octave below a standard E? So... I felt that a lot of the major manufacturers were just adding strings to their guitars and I felt like you could do some ergonomic and sort of some practical changes to make that extended range guitar feel more just approachable, you know? So I kind of started sketching up this thing, this is the Lorada. It's a multi-scale eight string guitar that has slightly narrow string spacing so the overall width of the neck is more manageable than if you have like say Floyd Rose spacing times eight, you know, you get kind of a surfboard of a neck. This is a bit more narrow and then the the, the neck of the guitar is actually shoved pretty deep into the body. So um, yeah, so you're, so you're not actual, way out there. Exactly, yeah. So you're not way out there and it feels a bit more like centered. It actually places you kind of, if you look down, you're right above the 12th fret, which is, which is nice. And then there's this undercut here that allows for like a classical seated position. That's great which I'm a fan yeah. of, yeah, and then it's also got a scale length that is a traditional 25 and a half here to 27 and a half. So your low strings have that scale length for timbre, um, so you have that type of fundamental clarity, and uh, your treble strings aren't suffering from too much scale length, which can change the amount of tension and the actual timbre of the, of the note. A lot of extended range guitars were designed for rhythm playing in the low right. register, and I'm, I'm a guy who's like trying to do a lot of lead work and I'm all over the fingerboard. So I tried to just make it more compact and approachable. Here's the back side of it. It's got a super accessible, oh, yeah. I, mean, I can reach the high, the 24th fret with like no drama at all. I was kind of inspired by like things like Fodera basses with this single cut, you know, and you get some structural rigidity, you know, the neck is kind of sharing more contact with the body. Right from here to here as opposed to just attaching at a single point. I mean, there are merits to bolt on, to glue joints, to neck through, but uh, for this particular shape, I think it, I felt like it made sense to have at least one iteration that was a, a glue joint. There's some aesthetic choices like this bevel here. It, it serves a function. I like, I always like thin guitars, Yeah. you know, like the Ibanez S series, stuff like that. 
just anything that felt like it integrated like seamlessly against your body. So, you know, thin, fast playing necks, low action, thin bodies, lightweight. So, you know, you just grab all your favorite characteristics and, you know, try to put it into a balanced guitar. And I'm super stoked with these. I think they look cool. They play great. They're lightweight. I got to get you I'd, one. I'd love to. I've, I've never even... <laughs> I. Well, when I came by Nam and you said, "Oh, you want you want to play it?" And I was, uh, no, <laughs> not in front yeah, of uh, not, not in front of uh, you know a bunch of people there trying to play. I've never I've never played. I mean, I've played seven string. I've never ever touched an eight string guitar before. Well, I think you would be. You have like you know really thorough knowledge of the fingerboard, so I feel like you would be able to just I think digest the extra strings a little bit quicker and I, like. A lot of the playing I've heard from you is like it's guitar playing, but you also have like a lot of other non-guitar influences, and like I think that sort of open-minded approach to guitar lends itself to the extended range because you're not like bummed you don't sound like Clapton or something. You're you're okay with you know exploring tonalities and and different different sounds and stuff like that. Maybe there's a Rick Beato uh, video in the future. Where well, you're well, so it, 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 guitar. well, that's interesting. I always did things that I always liked intervallic playing and I did hammer ons from nowhere. I, I mean, I was doing these things when I started playing, you know, 40 years ago, 30, 40 years ago, because I wanted to create sounds that didn't sound like a guitar, just like you're talking about. You didn't have guitars that were set up to do that even. And you didn't think about doing that, you know, to, to go have somebody set your guitar up to play well. I mean, nobody... Th- we didn't think about those things. It was like, okay, you can use eights and then you, they're easier to, to, to play. But other than that, it wasn't, you know, nobody had done fan frets or extended range guitars really, or, uh, you know, none of that stuff. And I think it's so exciting with you doing these things and just the, that whole new guitar design, I think is really great. Yeah. Um, I totally agree with you. It's cool. You've seen the evolution of gear over time, guitars and, and, and otherwise, because, there are things that like you like wish you kind of fantasized that existed and, and like a lot of them now have come to, to, to fruition. So yeah, I think uh, it's kind of like, man, if you're playing guitar in 2020, you, you can produce any sound you want. Yeah. I mean, any style of guitar, any style of amp, like it's like, we're kind of in this really amazing, like, golden age cornucopia <laughs> <laughs> Tosin when you're That's playing cool. on your low on the low strings playing single notes do you actually practice things uh, scales arpeggios things like that starting on the low string or no That's a great question and actually I actually have like a six string guitar centered perspective so that's kind of the core of my arpeggio shapes and scale shapes and then what started happening was I would um, maybe have a chord voicing and I would shift, you know. I mean, there's little things you can do, like, um, so it's just like an E minor 9, but I have a low E. It's awesome. An octave below, yeah. right? And you can do, or even like, um, when you're voicing chords, you, you you have choices of like what the lowest note can be, um, and so it allows you positionally to have root notes in a higher position. Um, And then, you know, there's... Where you can, because you have so many strings, you can have an independent yes. bass line and then almost an entire guitar neck available for chords. And then um, you can do straight up like... Um, sound like a bass if you want Tosin, to. Tosin, what, what is the gauge of your low string, your low E string there? This is a 72 or 74. Okay, so I wanted to ask you about the, your pickups too, the Fishman pickups there. Yeah. 
Okay, so is this your design? Yeah, so Fishman has this technology that they call the Fluence, um, Fluence technology, and it's, it's a magnetic pickup, but okay. it isn't a, it's not a mechanically wound pickup. Instead of like winding the pickup, they actually print 48 layers of coil. Yeah. Interesting. I don't like, I am no, I'm not an engineer, but like, it's been explained to me, and, and it, gener- it basically produces this like noiseless pickup that you can voice in myriad ways like you can you know they've got stuff that sounds like a paf but they've got stuff that sounds like you know know, like a dual blade really gnarly like bill lauren style humbucker it has the ability to kind of um split in a way that is way close it sounds like an actual single coil pickup as opposed to this sort of almost single coil pickup thing that happens when you split most humbuckers right and um there's a lot of dynamic differences, like the transient attack is, is noticeably faster. There's an inherent com- compression to the pickup, but it isn't limited, like most actives are. You don't feel like you're hitting a wall, but you do feel like um, all that detail is really balanced and available. I've got mine to accept a really wide frequency range just because of the eight string guitar. And um, a lot of the tapping and slap stuff I do, um, I want it to have a very balanced and a fast transient attack. Because that stuff cuts through the mix and it, it just, so like, it just se- feels like a perfected version of like my favorite like passive pickups with a little bit of things I like from actives, minus some of that stuff that, you, you know, some people don't like out of an active pickup. If you're thumping, is there a pickup that you prefer, you know, one over the other? Yeah, yeah. That's a, that's a it's like a huge part of the sound. If I was on the, the bridge humbucker... If I go to position two, so with the thumping stuff, say I did it on the, um, if I did it on the bridge pickup, you get this sound. If I go to position two, wow, totally, totally different. Yeah, and I mean, dude, it, it, it's like actually really fun to do rhythm stuff on that setting. It's got this crazy growl to it. And then, you know, like... Tosin, Tosin, do you? It's, it looks like you just are occasionally just hitting a couple downstrokes, and everything else is just. I'm like, where are these coming from? <laughs> this is all your left hand. Yeah, it's it's getting it's getting to that point where I don't even <laughs> I don't even know anymore. Your 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 right hand's kind of just going. Um, okay, yeah, that note. I'll hit that note too, and then all this stuff is happening, and it's so consistent sounding though. Producing notes primarily on the left hand, you can arrive at this really even dynamic output. You know? You know? Yeah, I mean, those things would be impossible to play any other way. That's so interesting. Yeah, it, it is like, I mean, there are some freaks out there who are, they can pick virtually anything, but I actually think it would sound different, and I know I can't do that, and I really like, um, I really like where it's going. It's still kind of a newer emerging thing for me, but like, I just feel like it's a unique and compelling sound, and yeah, you're encouraged to do these wide interval spreads at crazy speeds, and you know... So, I mean, the fluence is, like, I tried a lot of pickups, and, like, honestly, depending on what you're going for, there's, you got, there's so many choices, but for that sort of hyper-real, hyper-clean sound, I voice my pickups to do that. Like I said, they have classic stuff, they have PAF-sounding stuff, and it excels at that as well. My whole thing is just sharpening the knife of, like, the sound I hear in my head and then finding the gear to actually make that as easy as possible to produce. How important is compression in your sound? Um, it's pretty huge, actually, because when you're playing a lot of notes really fast, you don't want loss of information. So the my Fluence pickups do have some inherent compression in them. It's really nice. I mean, honestly, like, it's not like a... It's not 
not like it just sounds like a mastered guitar track. I don't know. It's weird. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. Like, <laughs> it's really cool. So then um I actually do run a unique compressor. Rupert Neve and Reinhold Bogner got together and made a pedal. It's called the Harlow. Have you oh, encountered yeah. this thing? Yeah, I've seen I've seen those, yeah. The Harlow is cool because it's uh it's not a really discreet compressor. It, it it's got this sort of drive like quality to it, which to me sounds and feels like when you turn the master channel of an amp up and you start to get some some saturation in the power section. Yeah. And so when you palm mute, you're not, you know, some compressors they limit your your peaks and they give you this sort of like this seems to like almost uh exaggerate some of the oomph. So uh, it's really cool. Uh, let's see if I um I'll play with it off. With it on. Oh yeah. Yeah, and if I do it on, yeah, I'm gonna actually like turn it up a little bit so you can hear kind of what it's doing. So this is without it. Oh. Huge. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you get um, you get a ton of uh, detail on the attack of the note and this nice sort of uh, slammed sound. That's kind of like some secret sauce that I keep on my board just to, you know. But yeah, it's a great title. Okay, so I won't tell anyone. I'll, I'll edit that out then. <laughs> no longer a secret. <laughs> I mean, no. It's... <laughs> It's cool. Okay, so I want to ask you too about your your amp, your neural DSP plugin. How did you guys come up with that? What do you think the benefits are of that versus real amp amplifiers? I know you use both, obviously, as we talked about. But what do you like about having your own plugin and and being able to do things in the computer like that? like machine learning to like model amplifiers and this is definitely outside of my wheelhouse but I think they're able to create a version of a real amp's behavior by basically over time monitoring its behavior and these these data sets become like the template for this like digital version of the real thing mm -hmm. and it's uncanny like I sent them Basically, I sent them my rig, my pedal board, and this Morgan head, and just like basically, I was like, "All right, well, this is what I use. If we're doing my plugin, like, make what I use." And I mean, they nailed it. Like, I have plugged in direct and played, and then also used the plugin with the same settings for my board and amp, and the 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 result is just amazing. And you were asking, like, what are the benefits? I mean. You can basically, um, you have this low CPU plugin that if you have some DI tracks or something like that, you can just open up a plugin on that track and you have a range of new tones and you're not going through the whole like actual physical reamping process, which is great for, you know, recording. And then also if you're traveling and you don't have a, oh, yeah. a lot of outboard work here with you, yeah. you know, you have like this really great sound and great feeling too, which is like, that's the thing with a lot of digital gear is... The sound, I think, is a thing that like is a, an attainable goal for a lot of companies, but the feel is different for each one depending on how they go about creating that sound. And the, the neural stuff sounds phenomenal, and it feels phenomenal. It's actually fun to play on. So that's kind of that thing. They're, they're killing it. Like I'm really excited that that company exists. And um, I love, really I love those guys. You, know, you and I have talked about that, those, uh, you know, Dark glass neural DSP. That's they just are. They they make great stuff. That's really future looking company. Yes, absolutely. And welcome contributions to the gear the gear universe. So um, I'm happy that it came out so well. I'm really. I think there's a lot of people who've gotten in who are happy with it too. So it's you have your guitar company. You're an artist. You have all these different things that you're doing all at the same time. What do you what do you do? What is your focus gonna be on? Dude, if you had asked me this question three months ago, <laughs> it would have been a totally different, different answer. answer. <laughs> <I know. laughs> 
By the way, so, everybody, subscribe to Tosin's YouTube channel and follow him on Instagram. Yeah, I'll have it. Tosin I'll, Abasi. I'll have it in the uh, in the description below. Thanks, Rick. Yeah. Um, basically, I was doing the the standard template of touring musician. You know, you you release an album every cycle, whatever that is for your band, and you you tour. Maybe there's a, maybe you do some other stuff, but that is basically the the foundation of yeah. like you know, how I would plan my years, you know? But now, um, touring seems to be, like, really, like, up in the air. Um, it's an unprecedented change to reality that everyone from booking agents to venue owners to tour bus companies, we're just all like, yo, what is happening? Yeah. So, you know, I think <laughs> we will all become internet people basically <laughs> you know i was looking at pictures uh or i was looking at uh things on instagram today of live you just i yeah, follow musicians and i was looking at live shows and thinking wow people used to play live shows <laughs> i mean it's just these yeah. are only from three months ago too you know i was thinking wow that is so strange it's crazy that yeah now your brain is looking at thousands of people in close quarters together and you're like, whoa, that's, <laughs> that's weird. It that's, only took a few months. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I think, um, it's been a good opportunity in some ways. Um, if you're an optimist, like I think the reach of the internet is, is amazing. And I think if you're lucky enough to, to be able to pivot and, and produce stuff online for people to consume, there's a way to kind of get through this, like, okay, you know, I think there are a lot of amazing players who aren't really trying to be on Instagram or YouTube. That's just not their yeah. thing, you know? But um, I think for me, I, I definitely, like, would take a page from the Rick Beato book and just, like, just start talking about things that are interesting to me and maybe interesting to other people and just showing what I'm doing and maybe just doing that on a regular basis and just building that, I think, would be the way I'm planning my, my future at the moment. Yeah. Cool. What do people not know about you, Tosin? I'm a high school dropout. Is, is that true? I was just like, I used to skip school all the time, and I would have had to like make up all these credits, and I was like, I hated going there. <laughs> so I just got my GD and just moved you on play- and started like, touring. You, you were playing guitar all the time, right? Yeah. I was kind of like a younger, like, you know, I'm like 18 years old, but I wanted to play with older guys who had like bar gigs and like real, you know, maybe some regional touring. And so I just took my GD, got a job, and then when I wasn't working, I would like try to play with the professional musicians in the, in the area, stuff like that. I was pretty clear that I wanted to escape the rat race and just be a musician. And your, you know? your folks were cool with that, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, my parents are from Nigeria and education's a huge, huge thing. And luckily my dad is like really open-minded and he bought me my first guitar and he was really, you know, he was like encouraging. I think, yeah, if it wasn't for him, I think my mom would've been like, no. <laughs> <laughs> You're not dropping out of school. You're not playing the guitar. <laughs> yeah, it's just not not on her. Yeah. Well, Tosin, this has been great. It's fascinating to hear what you're doing, and you're just doing such great stuff. I'm really, really curious to see where you go with this over the next few years. Right on, man. Yeah, I um, I appreciate that, and I appreciate you having me on. And like, I'm definitely more inspired than ever, and. I'm excited to see what I do, too. So we'll, we'll be in touch. I'm going to keep sending you stuff I'm working on. I'll see what you think about it. Awesome. Awesome. All right, man. Yeah, man. Take care. Thanks. You, too. That's all for now. Please subscribe here to my Everything Music YouTube channel. If you're a first-time viewer, don't forget to ring the bell. If you're interested in the Beato book, which has plenty of examples of this in it, Go to my website at www.rickbeato.com. You can find it there. Follow me on Instagram at rickbeato1. I've got a lot of guitar improvisations there. Check out the new Beato ear training method. Go to beatoeartraining.com and watch the introduction video. And if you want to support the channel even more, think about becoming a member of the Beato Club. Thanks so much for watching.